Absolutely. Just like you would have roads in a stateless society or education system, lots of institutions that we take for granted and we use now. I mean, the reason the state has co-opted these institutions is because there's a need for them. But the state has taken them over and we get used to the idea of them being conjoined with the state. In fact, this is one reason I think people um, conflate the term government with state. And they use this sort of argument, um, uh, well, if you believe in law and justice and order, then you believe in the government and therefore you believe in the state. And the reason is because government just means the governing institutions of society, which is law and justice. But if you get used to the idea that the state controls that, you can't imagine those things without the, without the state. Just like people can't imagine education or healthcare or roads without the state, uh, because we're so used to it. Um, but of course, justice, law and order, um, government, you could call it, governing institutions are essential to human society and would exist and have existed without the state. Right, so when I was uh, a young libertarian, youngish, although I started in high school, so I was already um, heavily interested in, in law school, um, I came across, well, I came across a couple of things. Um, I was interested in libertarian rights, how we know what rights we have, what rights are, um, not just the economic arguments for libertarianism, the consequentialist arguments, which most of us are interested in, but also what is the nature of rights? What property rights, what individual rights, what human rights do we have? And one argument that I came across in 1988, I believe, in, in law school was the argument by Hans Hermann Hoppe, the Austrian um, economist and libertarian philosopher, which is called argumentation ethics. And he argues um, that the only coherent case you can make for a normative political system is the libertarian one because any other argument is basically socialist in a certain sense uh, and is self-contradictory. So when I read that, it stimulated me. And at the same time, I was taking contract law in law school. And there's a concept in the common law called estoppel. And estoppel is this common law doctrine where if you try to make an argument to defend yourself from being bound by a contract in a, in a, in a legal case, um, if you contradict an action you had made before that the other party relied upon, you can be prevented from making that argument because it's contradictory or you're, you're stopped, as you call it. So that idea sparked in me the idea that, oh, this sort of explains the legal reasoning or the reasoning in the libertarian essence, the, idea, the, es the essential libertarian idea, which is a type of symmetry, right? Only libertarians are really uh, consistent in applying this idea that it's wrong to hurt other people. Basically, it's wrong to commit force or to initiate force against other people, to commit aggression. And what we say is it's permissible to use force, but only in response to force. So there's a certain symmetry to our, to our reasoning we say that it's okay to use force, but only in response to someone who's started it. And any initiation of force, which we call aggression, is always impermissible and wrong. And if you take that consistently to the extreme, you end up as a libertarian, and then you end up as an anarchist libertarian. You realize that even the state itself is illegitimate. Um, and the estoppel idea sort of embodies that because Basically, the idea is, why is it okay to use force in self-defense against someone trying to harm me? Or even afterwards, when I'm trying to obtain justice or retribution against the person who, hurt, who harmed me. And the idea is that it's okay to use force against them precisely because they would be stopped from complaining about the use of force against them because they had used it themselves. So what, I, what, what occurred to me was that there's a symmetry in the way legal estoppel is used. Estoppel says that you can't utter a statement that contradicts what you said before. So you have to be consistent in your reasoning. And I thought, well, that's exactly what we argue in libertarian, the non-aggression principle, like the idea that it's okay to use force against someone, but only if they've initiated it. So the idea there is that the person who initiates force, the aggressor, has himself sort of admitted the acceptability of the rule it's okay to use someone's body or property without their consent. 
So if you do the same back to him, he has no grounds to complain. He would be a stopped. So this led to me trying to develop an entire legal theory or moral theory, uh, libertarian theory of rights based upon something modeled after this, lib this legal theory of estoppel. So my theory of rights is estoppel. It's, it's heavily, it borrows upon Hoppe's argumentation ethics. But yeah, that's, that was my main initial interest in libertarian theory, the estoppel theory of rights. It took a while to figure this out, and um, I, um, I am an intellectual property attorney, so that spurred me to th – I mean, I had always read the arguments for patents and copyrights, which are types of intellectual property by Ayn Rand and other libertarians, and I sort of assumed that it was part of the capitalist Western system, although the arguments never quite made sense to me like when I was in college. But I let it rest. I figured that was one area of specialization which I just didn't know a lot about, like tax law or antitrust law. But when I started practicing patent and copyright and other types of IP law, uh, I just started trying to puzzle this issue out and think about it. And, I, and every argument I heard was not satisfying to me. So I tried to, I said, I will figure this out because I'm grounded in. Randian ideas and anarchist ideas, Rothbard, Mises, Austrian economics, and I know IP law as an actual lawyer. I, I can figure this out. That was sort of my mission, sort of like an atheist trying to prove there's a god, right? You want to prove it. Um, but finally, I, I kept butting my head against the wall, and I realized finally I failed in my task. And the reason I failed is because there's a mistaken assumption in the entire way that we approach this issue. Um, intellectual property is just a term that's used to cover up the, the patent and copyright, basically. It's used, to, it's used to sell them to the public, to make them think like they're part of a property rights system. But really, they're intellectual, prop they're intellectual uh, privilege. They're government grants of monopoly privilege. And um, they arose from, historically, they arose from the practice of, of sovereigns to grant a monopoly grants of privilege, which are called letters patent or open. Patent just means open in Latin. It was an open letter by the king telling everyone, this guy has my permission to have the monopoly on this trade in this area um, or to settle this land. So it was just the monopoly grant of privilege by the government. And copyrights arose from censorship of uh, thought um, when the printing press arose. The the, um, the church and the state got very nervous about the ability of people to have books that weren't authorized. So these things arose as an attempt to protect people from competition in the case of patents and to censor free speech and freedom of the press in the case of copyright. So it's, not, it's no surprise that that's what they resulted in in the case of the, of the, of the New World in the West with America, the Constitution of 1789, with copyright and patent. Uh, so if you understand the origin of these things and you understand that the essential purpose is to give someone who releases into the public some information, right? People don't think of it this way because they're used to thinking of, uh, if I create a novel, I created that thing and I can control its economic benefit. If I create a new invention, I should be able to reap the benefits of that. And you should be, if you do it in, in accordance with property rights in the free market. Um, so what happens is uh, if you publish a novel or if you invent a new machine, you have a choice. Do I keep this private or do I want to tell people about it? And usually you want to tell people about it because you want to sell this new mousetrap or this new wheat thresher or the, the cotton gin. And to release it to the public, you have to take the risk that other people might learn from that and they might compete with you. Now, we libertarians, we free marketeers, we voluntarists, we believe in the free market. We believe in property rights. We believe in competition. And presumably, we believe in learning and emulation and benefiting from the pool of knowledge that we've all inherited from, from humanity, right? From thousands of years of people coming up with ideas that we've benefited from. So there's nothing wrong or illiberal with any of this. What's illiberal and what's wrong is for the government to come in and give someone a temporary monopoly that tells them they don't have to compete, that they don't have to worry about people using their ideas if they release them into the public. So the essential problem with patent law 
for example, is that it gives someone protection over competition when they release their ideas into the public. And it's essentially anti-competitive and anti-free market. The essential answer is because legislation is impossible without a state. So the state basically, as Hans Hermann Hoppe explains in his, uh, one of his great articles, Banking in Nation States, he explains how the state gradually takes over certain institutions of society to basically bribe the people into being part of it. And of course, democracy is like the ultimate, um, the ultimate um, uh, thing that it does that, that makes everyone think we're part of the state. And you'll hear people say this nowadays, we are the government. You know, monarchy is not libertarian and is not the ideal, but at least in a monarchistic or in an, even an empire, there's a distinction between the ruler and the ruled, and the people that are ruled know they're ruled. So the monarchs can only get away with so much before they're, before they're decapitated or assassinated. At least there's someone you can go after if there's a corrupt monarch. Um, but in democracy, the tendrils of power are spread across the people through the power of voting, and through patronage and through jobs and people working in the public sector and people becoming dependent upon education and the communication system run by the FCC and the roads run by the, by the government. And over time, everyone is part of the state and they're so interwoven with it. And the government does that with law as well, with what we call legislation or democratic lawmaking as, as Hoppe would call it. Um, legislation is what we think of now as the even if you talk to many libertarians, like the income tax protesters who say that it's not illegal to, uh, to evade income tax because it's not the law. Because by law, they're thinking of a concept of natural law or justice, and it's not compatible with what the government says. So they start thinking of the law is not what the government says. And so uh, you have this divergence and you have this idea, this idea among even libertarians for example, if you say, well, it is illegal to evade income tax because if you don't pay, you go to jail. That's sort of the legal realist view of Oliver Wendell Holmes, and this is the legal positivist or the realist view that we all sort of share. We know that certain things are dangerous to do. I'm not saying it's wrong to violate drug laws or tax laws, but we all know that there's a danger in doing so. Um, but people start thinking of law as equating it with legislation. In other words, law is what the government says. So even nowadays, because of the domination of law by democratic lawmaking and legislation, people say, if you say it's, it's, it's illegal to, to evade income tax, they'll say, show me the law. Now, when they say show me the law, what they mean is show me a piece of paper with a written piece of legislation on it that clearly says if you don't pay income tax, you go to jail. Now, you can have this legal debate, and you can go to lawyers or professionals to talk about what the income tax code says. But the point is, the mentality of even these people is that law is something written. Now, this is in a way a Protestant mentality, right? Because the Catholic, the Protestant Reformation made people, the idea is that everyone can interpret the Bible on their own. So they start thinking of decree, moral decrees from God, and now legal decrees from the state as what's written down on paper and issued by a sovereign. This is the statist way of thinking, and it's not what law used to be until the modern revolution of the modern concept of the state, which is only about two or 300 years old, like the Westphalian um, concept of the state. Before that, law was thought of as private law. It was thought of as the emergent order that even the sovereigns and the governments were subject to. Um, nowadays, not so much. So now we have these debates about whether whether Trump can be subject to the law or not for pardoning or abusing his power. Everyone's confused about law now, but the point is that without a state, you can't have legislation. Without a state, all law would be an emergent, customary thing based upon reason and people's interactions. Without legislation, there are certain types of laws that could not exist, and those are the types that have existed only because of legislation. You couldn't have antitrust law. You couldn't have tax law. You couldn't have copyright and patent law, which were creatures of statute. The patent law itself originated in the statute of monopolies. Notice the word statute, which is another word for legislation, of 1623 in England in response to sovereigns, kings, abusing their uh, patent-granting authority. And copyright originated in the statute of Anne in 1710. So 
All these things originate from statutes. If you understand anything about the way private law emerges, that it's property law, how people come to own things, how they transfer rights, which is contract law, how they devolve upon death, which is a state's law, uh, and wills, things like that. Uh, all these things emerge naturally by people's customary interactions and always as a result of a dispute between two actual people that have a dispute with each other about who owns or controls a given resource. Okay, that's what disputes are. Disputes are thing, disputes over the control of a given thing. And when they have a dispute, they take it to someone who can help decide the issue. In the Roman law, in the common law, they were state controlled to some degree, but at least the question was of the judge or the juris consult or the arbitrator, what's the right thing to do here? What's the just result? So they would look for past precedents, they would look for custom, tradition, practice among people, and they would try to come up with a just result. And over time, this body of rules develops into law that people can rely upon. That's how the common law or customary law evolves. Nothing to do with decrees of, a, of an authority who just come in and announce what the new law is. That started happening gradually over time and it's really reached its, its pinnacle with the, uh, with the emergence of democracy in the, in the early 1800s and uh, after, especially after World War I. Um, so now democracy is dominant and law is made by legislatures and over time, even in the common law in England and the Commonwealth countries and in the U.S., the common law has become submerged in a sea of legislation, special legislation, codes written by the government that often contradict each other because there's no reason they wouldn't contradict. These are just decrees of the legislature. Um, in the common law, at least, the judges have to try to reconcile what they're going to decide, trying to do justice in a case between two actual parties. They have to try to reconcile it with the previous precedent. So there's some tendency for the law to be internally consistent but not so with legislation, which is exactly why uh, Obamacare, for example, almost was struck down because there was internal contradictions. There was the attempt to rescue it by Justice Roberts by calling this, um, this mandate a tax, but then later the tax went to zero after Trump's tax change. So now the question is, is the zero tax a tax? And so we get to this point where Nowadays, everyone thinks of law as whatever the government says. So then the question of law becomes a question of interpretation of words. Nothing to do with justice anymore. Does this guy get 25 years in jail because it was his third offense for smelling, uh, smoking, selling marijuana, or does he not? Doesn't matter whether he did anything wrong, whether the crime, whether the punishment is disproportionate to his alleged crime. Doesn't matter whether it's just or fair or consistent with other crimes punishments, all that matters is what the words on paper say. And when you start thinking of law that way, you start thinking of law as whatever the, the master dictates to us. And so we, we've become that way, we've become accustomed to it. But come back to IP, if you understand, let's leave trademark and trade secret law aside, which did evolve to some degree in the common law. Patenting copyright, as I mentioned, arose by statute as a result of monarchical excesses in in Europe and the statute of monopolies and the statute of, of, uh, of, of Anne and then the United States Constitution which was another statute enacted in a coup by a bunch of guys in Philadelphia in 1787 right and then the Congress in 1790 right away passed the first uh, acts of the, the Patent Act and the, and the Copyright Act these laws are inconceivable without legislation. And in a stateless, free society, you wouldn't have a legislature who could decree the law. And that's why patent and copyright could not even conceivably emerge in a free society. I would say, let's say three things. Um, number one, um, I am a libertarian, but I have become increasingly skeptical of the efficacy of activism as the way to achieve liberty. I'm not opposed to it. I believe in Albert J. Knox's idea of the remnant, keeping the flame alive, promoting liberty, but I don't think we're going to achieve liberty by 1% of us passing out pamphlets or nagging our uncles at Thanksgiving dinners. Um, 
I think there are free there are there are public choice economics reasons. There are free rider reasons why states emerge and why we have states now. Uh, but we don't have complete states. We have some degree of economic freedom for other reasons. Um, my view is that the only way true liberty will emerge is if it's natural. It, that is, if it would emerge even without any, any libertarians around to push for it. And I believe that can happen and probably will happen. But I think it requires us to have a certain degree of wealth and sophistication and even cosmopolitanism in the sense of viewing ourselves as members of the human society, not as members of this tribe or that tribe or that nation or that state or this race or that gender or whatever. And I do believe that is approaching as we become more technologically wealthy. So my personal view is we will achieve liberty when its time is right. Can we, can we hurry it along? I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't mind trying. I, I, I support doing that. But as for what we can do, I guess my simple answer would be the idea of Leonard Reed and Albert J. Nock. Try to be as successful in your life as possible. That is, uh, uh, be wealthy, be moral, be upright, be a beacon in your community so that people come to you instead of you lecturing to people. People see this guy successful. Maybe I'll ask him about this issue. What do you think about economics? What do you think about the next president. What do you think about this policy? So that's the idea of, of Leonard Reed called it, the founder of the a fee, one improved unit. Just your goal in life is to present one improved unit to society because that's enough of a job in and of itself to take care of yourself and your local family and then you'll be a beacon towards, towards that. And of course economic or, or personal improvement, learning about economics, learning about liberty, knowing what you're talking about when people ask you. So I think, realistically, the best thing to do is to try to succeed in your life and to stick to principles and then try to keep the idea of liberty alive. That's a good question. Um, and I, I actually studied international law after my, my regular law degree when I went to London. And uh, I've become fascinated with it and I've practiced in that area and I've written on that area. Um, international law is so is sort of a scary term for some libertarians because they become um, afraid of centralization, right? And so you had this heavy conservative and anti-communist movement in the 50s and 60s, which said America should get out of the United Nations, international law is bad, it affects our sovereignty, and those are all legitimate concerns. Although I think they're uh, they're they were they were overplayed, or at least they're not they're not the main concern now. The main concern is not the United Nations. Is the United States. Um, international law actually I believe is a good thing because it can serve as a model for how anarchy can work because there is no international sovereign. Even the US is not a final sovereign in the world. So you have 200 state actors, sovereigns on the international plane, which abide by each other on a private law plane, which is called international law. You can think of treaties as international contracts. And by and large, they respect international law norms States shouldn't commit aggression, or when they do, it's condemned by others. Contracts should be respected, which is a Latin idea, pacta sunt servanda, which is, underlies the idea that treaties are to be respected. So international law, I believe, can serve as a model for how we can imagine the possibility of a stateless order. Because we do have 200 citizens of the world which don't have an overarching uh, super sovereign. So it's possible to have peace among actors that are decentralized and that are sovereign with respect to themselves and don't have an overlord that forces them um, to comply with some kind of set of rules. So the Hob Hob Hobbesian idea that you can have order among individuals without a government to tell them what to do is sort of disproved by the existence of the international order and international law.